Losing your job sucks. That's the message of this new paper. In a way that isn't entirely obvious. We know when you lose your job, you're not gonna have income straight away. But it's worse than that. They then follow people who lost their jobs as a result of a plant closing or some sort of general retrenchment, a lot of like what we're seeing today. They followed them over the next 20 years. What we see is not only does your income fall, maybe 30, 40% in the year in which you lose your job, but it actually remains you know, 20% lower even 20 years later. So you're a whole heck of a lot poorer for a whole heck of a long time. They can quantify this. Uh, you take the net present value of uh, changes in your earnings, if you like. Turns out getting fired during a recession is very different than during a boom. During an expansion, if you get fired, your future earnings, its future value, falls by about 65000 During a recession, it's well over 100000 maybe 120000 So recessions hurt, and they hurt a whole heck of a lot more than during booms. Here we're talking to the deputy governor of the Swedish Central Bank. So he's been at the table as they're, they're making monetary policy over there. He's also been a very close commentator of monetary policy in the United States. The real question he's after is, can central banks make big mistakes? And Lars Svensson thinks they can, and maybe they did. He looks at both the US and Sweden. In both cases, he sees a violation of what any central banker should do. If inflation is below your target and unemployment is above your target, both of those are arguments saying you should re reduce interest rates. Yet he finds that in both Sweden and to a lesser degree in the United States, they didn't really follow this. So, Svensson's point is, monetary policy gets complicated when we have to decide whether we care more about our inflation target or about our unemployment target. But he's looking at the simple case when we're failing on both and reducing interest rates would help us on both. And he argues that in both countries, in fact, we saw a failure to do what was right, which was to ease monetary policy in the face of low inflation, possible deflation, and high unemployment. In Washington, everyone talks about small businesses as our economic saviour. The research says the emperor's got no clothes. You actually got to go and look inside the data and see who are small businesses. Are, these, are they these innovators? Are they these job creators? Well, think about it for a moment. And this is what the paper documents. Small business is actually really boring. It's barbers and hairdressers. It's real estate agents and lawyers. These are people who just have occupations, just like you and I. Uh, the problem is that they have, they're not entering these industries with any great goals of new patents, new innovations, the stuff that's gonna push economic growth in the future. Most of them have no intentions of growing or even hiring. These are just mum and pop stores today that are plan on being mum and pop stores tomorrow. The big policy issue here is when we use small, the word small business, I think what we really mean is entrepreneurs. And what the paper shows is small businesses are different than entrepreneurs. Huge policy implications. Instead of trying to target our entrepreneurship and our R&D policy to small business, what we've got to do is actually do the hard work of finding out who the entrepreneurs are, and they're not all hiding in small businesses. Unemployment insurance is one of the most contentious political issues right now. Uh, we've extended unemployment insurance during the recession, trying to help people out. Whether we're going to continue to extend it is an open question. It's a big part of the Obama jobs plan. The claim from some is if you, if you provide benefits while people are unemployed, they'll remain unemployed longer. As a result, the unemployment rate will rise. Some people even thought this was a big explanation for our current unemployment woes. This paper looks very carefully at comparing those who get insurance versus those that don't, comparing states that extended benefits versus those that didn't, looking at what happened when we didn't extend benefits relative to when we did, and suggest that there's really not much of an effect at all. In fact, the authors suggest that the unemployment rate maybe is 0.3 of a percentage point higher as a result of all these unemployment extension benefits. Now, at least half, so that's small. It's there, but it's small. But at least half of that is probably due to people staying in the labor force rather than dropping out. So in terms of its effects on jobs, it's an even smaller effect again. And then as we start to emerge from the recession, it may even turn out to be a good thing. What we've done is we've kept people in the pool of unemployed rather than outside the labor force. So when the jobs return, these folks are gonna be in a position to get back to work. And so it's even plausible, the effect is positive. So quantitative easing sounds mysterious. Uh, the Fed pumping money, billions of dollars through the system. In fact, the reality is a lot simpler. 
What's the Fed trying to do? It's trying to reduce interest rates. Normally the Fed reduces short-term interest rates. Right now, they're at zero, so it's going to try and reduce long-term interest rates. That's what quantitative easing does. That's all this bond buying programs you hear about. So what the authors do is they go and look at the first two episodes, QE1 and QE2, and look to see how it did affect interest rates. When the Fed buys treasuries, it actually succeeds at doing what it's trying to do, reduces the interest rates on treasuries. But what, what matters for businesses, businesses don't borrow using treasuries. Corporate bonds are different again. And it turns out that actually QE1 and QE2 were quite successful at reducing the interest rates that real businesses uh, were borrowing. There's a different issue though, which is we might care about mortgage-backed securities, and so mortgage rates. And it turns out QE1 involved buying a lot of those securities, and it affected those rates. QE2 didn't buy those securities, and didn't affect those rates. So the way you do quantitative easing affects which interest rates are affected, and by how much. I think the broader and bigger point that the paper makes is actually it's not just the buying of bonds, but it's the ability of the Fed to shape the expectations of the market that really drives the biggest effects of quantitative easing. Basically, if the Fed says, we want long-run interest slow, low, not slow, <laughs> we want long-run interest slow, we've got a big pile of money here that we're going to do it with, they don't end up needing to use the money because the markets understand that they could always come and use that money, and so interest rates fall very quickly.